John chapter 1, verse number 17, the Bible says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And we've been preaching through the book of Deuteronomy, and we've talked about this thing of law, that the law uh, is not to be looked at as something that can save you, but the law, the law of God back there in the Old Testament is given as something to govern our lives uh, in a culture, in a community, in a, in a family, and in a nation. And law and grace, it's an area that it's imperative to rightly divide the word of truth. So this will be a teaching kind of message tonight. Maybe you want to make some notes, but I, I hope it will be a blessing and encouragement to you. Lord, help us to preach tonight and feed the flock of God and to glorify your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I do thank you for grace tonight. Lord, I thank you for grace. And help me to humble myself that I might receive more and more grace as the years go by. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, if, there, if you don't uh, get grace and law uh, rightly divided, it produces mass confusion. I will submit to you tonight that a large percentage of religion in America is a mixing of law and grace. They will tell you that you're saved by grace, but in essence they're telling you that you're kept saved by law, which is not true. The book of Galatians and the book of Romans teach us entirely against that. But when you tell, have somebody tell you that if you do certain such things, if you're supposed to be a Christian... And you do certain such things, and that would cause you to lose your salvation. You are then mixing law and grace, which is a very dangerous thing to do. And it takes away from the finished work of Jesus Christ. is contrary, clearly, to the Scriptures. And that's why I want to be really careful going through the Deuteronomy and things, because if you're not careful, you'll start kind of moving and migrating toward this. Well, I've got to keep this and do this and do this and do this in order to either be saved or to keep saved. And it's neither. They cannot either save you nor keep you saved. It causes a lot of confusion, it causes a lot of division. A lot, most of the divisions between denominations in America is on this issue right here. Those who believe totally in the absolute grace of Jesus Christ to save them, plus nothing, minus nothing, and those who believe that Jesus did die, but you've got to do this, this, or this, or the other. And there's a whole list of those things we talked about. Some people say, unless you're baptized, uh, you, you're, well, you know you didn't get saved. If you don't quit smoking, no, you didn't get saved. If you don't... Uh, do this. You don't wear a dress as long as I do. You're not saved. All those kind of things. And I'm for convictions and I'm for governance. But I never preach that governance saves you. Christ's blood and His substitutionary sacrifice saves you. Now, first of all, if we, but, but there's a possibility that churches can be what I call overrunning grace. They neglect the law. They never preach the law. They never talk about the law. They never teach or preach the law. And they always talk about grace. And here's the reason they do it. They have people in their church who, who are uh, either uh, not been taught right or who are not saved, okay, and people who are worldly and the world starts coming into the church and they want to preach anything that would offend them that would cause those people to not come back to church. You can't operate a church of the Lord Jesus Christ like that. You, if you do that, you'll have to compromise and pretty soon the worldliness will take that church over and it's as dead as last year's rocks. But you can overdo in grace. Now, here's what happens when grace is overdone and law is neglected. Jesus did not neglect law. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. And He said, heaven and earth not pass away till all be fulfilled. He said, I didn't come to do away with the law. But when you overdo it, grace will be turned into what the Bible calls lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is shameless immorality. And here's why it becomes shameless. It gets people gets to where there's no shame in what they do. Because they've been told, because I, quote, believe on Jesus Christ, then I can go live like I want to because I'm saved by grace. That, friend, is not biblical grace. That is a redefined grace that is not in the Bible at all. For the Bible teaches us that the grace of God will lead us to godliness and holiness and righteousness. And if, that, if the grace that you pretend to have, the grace that you say you're saved by, is not producing Christ-likeness in you, is not producing holiness in you, is not producing the love of God in you and righteousness in you, it is not the grace of God. It is a substitute uh, re religion, it's a substitute uh, a spiritual activity of the devil in your life. And so grace can be turned into lasciviousness. In other words, a license to sin. And it uh, brings worldliness in the church. But a neglect of the law of God and the principles of the law of God, which is, is needed, and they are needed in the church because that's what brings men to Christ. The law makes us see our need of a Savior. The reason we preach law is to make men see the sinfulness of their own lives. If nobody ever preaches the law to you, you see, if I say to you, if, if, you're a, if, a, if, a, if a, uh, a, a policeman arrests you tonight and, uh, and says, you know, you're charged with so-and-so and throws you in the jailhouse over there, you want to know, what am I guilty of? 
But you see, you can, here's the thing about it. If he tells you what it is, and he, he shows you what it is, and they, that's why we have courts, is to, is to prove guilt in law. And so a lot of people, this is why the, they want the Ten Commandments hung up in schools or anywhere else. Because that law will make you realize there's a holy God, He has righteous standards, and we're accountable to Him. And it causes the person to realize, that, to see their own depravity and their own sinfulness. It makes us see our sinfulness, but the law does more than that. It provides a superior way of life for those who are saved. And I want to tell you something. We'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. But if a church can be the other way, a church can be overdone in grace now and, and get lasciviousness and they bring their rock and roll in, they bring all their filth in, the nastiness in the church, you can't tell it. But a church can also, and here's what happens. There are people sitting in churches where they have overdone grace, in other words, or misused grace, and they see, they say, something's wrong here. This is not godly. This is not right. Why are they letting this in the church? Why is this going on in the church? I mean, tell you, this is the truth. America's full in our churches right now. People walking in, shacked up. They're not even married. And preachers won't even preach against it. And people are saying, well, and people, I mean, the church is full, full of people walking in half naked. Can I tell you something tonight? Nakedness in any form is wicked and sorry and low down and ungodly. God, I mean, you know, but you walk in churches now and it's just like you. You can't tell the difference between you walked into church or walked into Battlefield Mall. Now, so what happens is people see this lasciviousness and they're driven over to legalism. And they go back to the law and they try to reestablish, you see. And so all of a sudden now you've got these two factions. You've got the legalist and you've got the licentiousness. And they're battling each other. They're calling you legalists. You don't know what grace is. And they're saying, you don't know what grace is. Does this make sense? They're saying, you don't know what grace is because you're trying to put us under the law. You're saying, well, to dress right, talk right, spit right, and all that. And they're saying, you, can, you think you can do anything you want to do and, live for, and be a Christian? You're crazy. And so they're all fighting each other. You know, the way it works, right? All right, so, but if you get overdone on the law, here's what's going to happen. If you get on this side here, it won't save anybody. Nobody's ever been saved by the law. Can't save, the law can't save you. Not only that, but it will make you legalistic. You will eventually uh, uh, migrate to the point of where you think nobody's saved if they don't dress like you do and walk like you do and talk like you do and do the things you do. I've seen homeschoolers get to the point of where they almost think, if, no, if you don't homeschool, you're lost. I've seen people at Christian school. I mean, let me tell you something. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that if, if thou shalt quit smoking, thou shalt be saved. Nowhere in the Bible does it say if thou keep thy hair cut short, thou, thou shalt be saved. Nowhere in the Bible does it say if you wear a dress down to your ankle, thou shalt be saved. Now, here's what I'm getting to. Pretty soon you get people, and they won't out and out say it, but they just inculcate it into everything they're doing. And pretty soon you get the idea, you kind of get the message that if I don't live like these people live, I'm not saved. And that's not true. You're saved by the grace of God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, legalism does something worse. It makes the cross of Christ of none effect. And that's the awfulness of it. It produces works religion. Which teaches you that in order to maintain and keep your salvation, you have to live under those set of rules and things. But worse than that, legalism hides grace from the heart. And it produces hypocrisy. And it gets to this point where it's this. As long as you live like I live, you're okay. But if you sin different than I sin, you're lost. And the truth about it is that a lot of, in a lot of churches in America, and I tell you, we've got to guard against this here. In our church here, in the church that God has given us to worship here, we have got to guard against this hypocrisy because, let me tell you something, as far as I'm concerned, there are a lot of things worse than what we call this, some of these sins out here. Let me tell you something, subtle, deceptive, lying, and hypocrisy of the mind and heart that people cannot see is worse than anything. And when we cloak ourselves with religion to hide our sins, that's what Jesus really went against when he was preaching. So be careful about that. Now, as I said in John, our text, it says that law, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. The law was given to Moses by God. It was threefold. There's a moral law, civil law, and ceremonial law in the Old Testament. And portions of Deuteronomy and Leviticus are expansions and case studies of those three sections of the law. And yet they are one law, even though they're broken down into three areas. The moral law. The civil law tells you how to run your government. Moral tells you how to live your personal life morally. Civil law tells you how to run your government. And then you have the ceremonial laws was how to worship God. There was, by the way, let me say this to you. There was both law and grace before Moses at Mount Sinai and before Jesus at Calvary. In the Garden of Eden, God has set the law for it. Thou shall not eat thereof. Right? That's law. But you know what? God gave them grace. He clothed them with skins 
and forgave them and redeemed them through the blood of a sacrifice and a substitute. And so you see also the law and grace in Noah's day. There was a flood. God condemned and God destroyed. That was law. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the ark was a picture of grace and the flood was a picture of law. Now the Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 2, 14, that the law was not given to the Gentiles primarily. It was given to the nation of Israel. Israel is not the church and the church is not Israel. The law was primarily and exclusively given to the nation of Israel in the sense for their guidance and their direction as a peculiar people unto the Lord. But... In Romans chapter 11, the Bible teaches us that we as Gentile believers are grafted into the olive tree and are partakers of the blessings that come from the governing laws of Almighty God. Brother, I tell you, that's the truth. And God has blessed this nation as we inculcated the Judeo-Christian principles and laws, governing laws of the Word of God. Example, in Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, the Sabbath law was given to Israel for a sign between God and Israel and throughout their generations. And yet the Bible teaches and prophesied in Hosea, and also, I believe, in in Ezekiel, that the Sabbath would be set aside and then reinstituted when Jesus Christ comes back and through the millennial reign. Now, I'm not being mean to anybody tonight, but the Seventh-day Adventists and all your Saturday-night people uh, haven't got a clue because they wrongly divide the word of truth, and they're totally messed up about things because they went so far back into the law, see? And and, and by, by the way, here's what happens with this legalism thing. It, is, it really feeds the flesh because it says, well, I don't do that. I don't do that. And it makes you feel proud and superior. And that's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees had gotten themselves in. Now, just take, for instance, the Jehovah Witnesses. Jehovah Witnesses claim that, uh, first of all, they claim for a long time that the, there were the 144,000. Isn't that right? They'd come up to your door and talk to you about you need to become a Jehovah Witness because you'd be 144,000. Well, i got news for them today. The 144,000 discussed in the Bible is, is Israelite people. Now, the 12 tribes, and God lists the 12 tribes. And what I always want to ask the Jehovah Witnesses is, what tribe of a Jew are you from? And they can't even answer that because they're not a Jew. And so it's not rightly dividing the word. That's where it comes to, not re- rightly dividing the word of truth. And so, in, by the way, not only that, in every area of life, uh, God tells them how to live. You know, God told them what to eat, what not to eat. God told them how to clean themselves. God gave them hygiene laws. God gave them health laws. And if we abide by these laws and let these laws govern our lives, He gave them laws concerning punishment of crime. He gave them laws concerning child rearing, finances, and every realm of life. And if you'll go back into the law, study that, read that, and hear that, God will bless your life. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. God tells you if you'll meditate in this in your temporal and material life, God will bless it by doing that. Now, what is the purpose of the law then? Number one, it's not to justify or to save because Romans 3.20 says, For by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in God's sight. It might be in man's sight, but not in God's sight will he ever justify anybody by the deeds of the law. The second purpose of the law is to give a knowledge of sin. People need a knowledge of sin. You know, the the tragedy is kids nowadays don't know that things are wrong. They're being taught this licentiousness that anything's all right, whatever I decide to do, uh, it's okay. And let me say this tonight to you concerning some of the major issues that's hitting this culture. For instance, sodomy, your queer, faggot, gay bunch. They are absolutely on a war path trying to convince children through books and schools, that that's a normal thing, that there's nothing wrong with it, and anybody that doesn't believe that is archaic and out of sync with the whole world. I've got news for those bunch of liars. They are evil, they are wicked, and they are wrong, and this Bible's still true, and they are perverts to the deepest degree. They are reprobate, and you're going to waste your time even, you're going to waste your time witnessing to them, because they're reprobate already, their mind is turned upside down. You listen to me tonight. This is the thing that will get you. And this is the battle rat. Kids need to be taught. They need. That's why God said for you fathers to read this law to your kids. How are you going to know who says what's right? Who says what's wrong? If it's left up to our own imagination, our own... Listen, the final authority is not what Reggie Kelly thinks. The final authority is what does this book say? And every person that ever walked on to in feet of this world is going to stand before God. And you're not going to be judged by what the culture is saying is all right. You're going to be judged by what the Bible said was right. 
And that's what it said. And you better get a hold of it. Your kids will be all of a sudden. I mean, who says smoking marijuana is wrong? Well, the Bible said not to defile the temple of the Lord, right? Who said, you know why I don't want to drink? But Listen to me. I don't want to drink, number one, because I don't want to mess my testimony up. But number two, the Bible said that wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever deceived by the is not wise. The Bible says he's a fool who drinks. So, you know, it just said, God, and these, that's why God said it's for your good. Uh, Paul even carried this further into the spirit of the thing in the New Testament. He said, the things that I'm writing to you are not for your destruction. If, oh, listen, young people, get this down. When the man of God preaches the Word of God, it is never, it is never, it is never for your destruction. It is for your good. Amen. Not for your destruction, it's for your good. You get in a good attitude about the preaching of the Word of God. You get a good attitude about God, a good attitude about the Word of God. And say, you know what, the Bible says that, that's right, and that's good for me. I may not understand it right now, but it's a blessing to my life. Number three, the law will stop the mouths of men. You can take the Bible and stop. The Bible said in Romans 3.19, For whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. People will make excuses about what they're doing. But the law will stop that. You remember the, the young man that came to Jesus Christ? And he said, Good Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And you know what? Jesus perceived in him that he was a legalist. That he thought he was a super, super spiritual person. And he said, thou knowest the commandments. And he started wrapping off all these commandments. And, and Jesus done some commandments. And, he, and you know what this young boy said? He's a stinking liar. He said, all these things have I kept from my youth up. Is anybody in this building that's kept the law of God perfectly from your youth up? No. So he was, he, he broke the command. He broke what was the fourth commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness before he ever got away from talking to Jesus. He lied. Jesus just used the law on him. You know what he said? He said to go sell. Oh, he said, that's great. Go sell what you have and give to the poor and come follow me. Do you know why Jesus said that? Because he had avoided the commandment not to be covetous. And Jesus knew that this man was covetous. And what Jesus did was use the law on it. There was two things in the Bible. Jesus Christ, when he dealt with lost people, always dealt with him in two ways. And this is how you need to, this is why perception is very important. A person is either proud, and if they're proud, cocky, and unbroken, they need the law to break them. But if they're humble, they need grace. When the woman was brought to Jesus Christ, caught in adultery, Jesus didn't quote Moses to her. Do you know what he said? Neither do I condemn thee. Go and what? Sin no more. He didn't give her licentiousness, neither did he give her legalism. He gave her grace. And he gave her Truth. Grace and truth comes by Jesus Christ. So the law stops the mouths of men. Listen, this is why we need to raise up a generation of leaders, political leaders, who know how to use the Bible without acting like an idiot. Who know how to articulate the truth of the Word of God in a political and cultural discussion. We need some leaders raised up who can sit on a news interview and when he's asked, oh, where's, what's your, now listen to me, listen to me, this just happened this week. Herman Cain was at, he's running for president. I, I hope he's a great guy, but I'm going to tell you this. He was asked a question about same-sex marriage. He ducked. He didn't want to answer. You know what he should have said? He should have said, listen, first of all, you need to understand I'm a Christian. As a Christian, my final authority is the Word of God. So you know something? It really doesn't matter what I think about same-sex marriage. Why don't you read the Bible and find out what God has to say about same-sex marriage? But I will tell you this in passing. Jesus said in the beginning, He created them male and female. See? And by the way, then He ought to turn around and say, Now, my basis of authority, Herman Cain should have said, My basis of authority is the Word of God. You tell me what your basis of authority is. And before that, no, no. Tell me what's your basis of authority. What are your beliefs based on? Tell me. Before you answer me, ask me another question. You're going to answer that question. What is the basis of your authority? The basis of my authority is right here. Like it or don't like it. Accept it or don't take it. But I want to know before we go further, what's the basis of your authority? Because you have a purpose in asking me that question. You have an agenda by asking me that question. Now, this is what I'm saying. We have got to, if we're going to restore America, we have got to raise up those kind of leaders both in the political system, both in the judicial system, in the educational system. Because, listen, education has to be based upon the Word of God. It's just like somebody got it preached the other night here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. 
And if you don't have that basis to start out from, you don't have any basis and you're just floating and quandering in a mire of human, humanistic reasoning. And the third, the fourth thing is this, to show the world that it's guilty before God, as I said, that until a man sees himself guilty before God, he'll never see his need of Jesus Christ. Let me just say what's going on in this country. Preachers aren't preaching the law of God. They're not producing conviction by the Holy Ghost of God. And you can't get saved without conviction. You can't get saved. That means, what is conviction? That's when the Holy Ghost of God tells you in your soul and your conscience, your spirit, you're guilty before God, you're in trouble with God, and you better do something about it before you bust hell wide open. That's conviction. You're guilty. You're guilty. You're a sinner. You're vile before Almighty God, and you deserve hell before a Holy God. That's conviction. But now what we've got, we've turned churches into little clubs that you join. Those social centers, we come to make ourselves feel better about our self-righteousness. That's exactly what we've turned them into. And we don't, we don't require conviction and repentance and turning from sin to anybody. Let me tell you something tonight. If God be my helper, I'll never lead you to Christ making, without, without seeing a repentant spirit in you and a desire to turn from your sin and to, and to love the Lord Jesus Christ and, and accept Him as your Savior. Don't come up here and shake my hand to join. We're not, this is not a club. This is not the Mooses. This is not the Masons. This is not the Elks. This is not the Aquinas Club. This is a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to repent. You have to admit you're a guilty sinner and you have to receive Jesus Christ humbly and earnestly from your heart and your soul to be saved. And you're not joining the church. God will put you in the church. Amen. Amen. He'll baptize you in the church. You don't need a church role. You get saved. Amen. You'll just look for people of like-minded faith. And you'll get involved and get rolling. Anyway, this is the big one. Galatians chapter 3 verse 25. The law is a schoolmaster to bring men to Christ. That's the real purpose of the law. Because you see, when the law is preached and the law is brought into effect, People see themselves as sinners. They see themselves as guilty. And then further they see themselves. You know, we just sung a song a while ago. By the law at last my sin I learned. Did you just mean? We just sung that a while ago at Calvary. Then what? I trembled at the law I spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned. Where? To Calvary. That song teaches you the whole essence of what the law is compared to grace and what the law is used in bringing you to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in Romans 10, 4, Jesus said this, or the Bible said this, that Christ is the end of the law to everyone that believeth. In other words, when you come to Jesus Christ and trust Him as your Savior, the law can't chase you any farther. It's done one time, I remember I was preaching on the subject here, and I had banned it as a, 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 going as a law center. Does anybody remember that? And Van ran, and I was pretending I was the law, and Van was the law sinner. And I chased him around this church house, and he ran up here to the cross. And I couldn't go any further than the cross. And when he got to the cross, the law couldn't chase him no more. See, Christ is the end of the law. And the law can't condemn you once you're in Christ. And your sins are forgiven. The law has no case against you once you're in Jesus Christ. I was witnessing to a man this past week, and I said to him, if you had a $100 fine up here at City Hall, and I went up there to pay, and I paid that fine for you. I said, can they charge you for that fine? He said, well, no. I said, that'd be devil jeopardy, wouldn't he? He said, yes. I said, if your fine is paid, it's paid, right? Yeah. I said, that's what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. He paid for all of your sins for all time. And if it's paid, it's paid, amen. So Christ is the end of the law. And finally, let me say this to you. In the way of the law, it gives a superior way of life in every area of life, both civil and and governmentally and civic and so forth, that marriage, you obey the law of God in marriage, you'll have a great marriage. Amen. I'm telling you what, it'll be good. Your home, you, you obey the law of God in your home, you have a good home. In the bearing and rearing of children. By the way, if you'll obey the law of God in social relationships, and finding the mate in life, Deuteronomy chapter 7 is going to talk about don't mix, don't mix, don't get out there, don't get out there and marry unbelievers. And you obey the word of God and God bless you for it and God will bless your life. So you have the Old Testament, you have the, watch this, you have the letter of the law. When you get the New Testament, you have the spirit of the law. Now remember that they would talk to Jesus, and Jesus would say this, Ye have heard, you read, you read the Bible, you'll find what Jesus would say. When he was teaching, he'd say, Ye have heard that it hath been said of them of old time. But I say unto you. Now notice something. This is good, now watch this. He did not say, ye have heard it is written. He said, ye have heard that it hath been said. Now, what was he dealing with? 
They had taken the law, the Old Testament, and they had twisted it around to where it didn't even mean at all what Jesus said. And they are trying to take the law and make it a means of salvation. And they never, they didn't know what it said at all. He said he'd bless them. He said he'd, it'd be well with them, that they'd be well with their children, but never said to save them. And so Jesus, if you read a lot of his writings, he's always saying, ye have heard, but I say unto you. Now let me tell you what else he did. He took the letter of the law and he lifted it to the spirit. The letter of the law said, thou shalt not kill. Right? Jesus said that if you hate your brother in your heart, you're a murderer already. You see, Jesus took it into the heart where the source of it is. And that's why John Adams said at the founding of this country that he wanted Christianity to be the religion of America. Because, he said, it rules men from their hearts and you don't have to rule them externally. Christianity is the only faith in the world that rules men from their hearts. And so Jesus went to the heart. And that's what preaching and teaching in our churches and our family. And hey, by the way, that's what you should do with your children. You don't legalize, letterize your children. Don't do this, don't do this. Here's a set of kids. No, no. You learn that you're, you, you give your kids a heart that want to obey mom and dad. That want to obey the Lord. And you don't stop with mom and dad. You talk about why this is a sin against God. Take a child's violations and take a child's training. Pass mom and dad. Pass the church. Pass the pastor. Take them to God. When you get your child in touch with God, you'll start getting something done with the heart. But anyway, the New Testament is the, is the spirit of the law. Let me give you another one in the New Testament, how the spirit of the law compared to the letter of the law. Jesus said, you've heard, uh, uh, said, thou shalt not commit adultery. That was the law, right? That's the letter of the law. But what did Jesus say? But I say unto you that whosoever looketh upon a woman with lust in the heart hath committed adultery with her already. They knew what he, Jesus is teaching us. That long before, listen to me, long before that man ever committed adultery with a woman, he had committed it in his heart long before. And that if he could have stopped that in the heart, it would have never happened in the actual. And that's why the Bible teaches us that salvation is a matter of the heart. If thou believest with thine heart, the Lord Jesus. Isn't that something? Something. You see, like Islam, all they can do is cut your hand off if you're stealing, but they can't take away the desire, other than from fear of losing the hand. But God can change your heart when you get saved. You don't want to steal from people. Change your heart. That's the beauty of Christianity and the power of Christianity. The law is a pattern for all just laws, for all nations, civic, social, and moral. It's the foundation for all success in life. Uh, you know, but not not uh, not taken away from Jesus Christ because He is the Word of God, and it's the means of bringing us to faith in Jesus Christ, and it is the basis of spiritual maturity. In Hebrews chapter five fourteen, but strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even to them that by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And that's why we need the law. Let me tell you, a child that's been taught the Word of God. He'll have a discernment about what's right and wrong. Even when he doesn't know just exactly what's going on, he'll say, the Holy Spirit says something's wrong here. Something about this is not right. That ability to discern between good and evil. And again, remember, the law cannot save, cannot save a person. It is unkeepable. You break one, the Bible said you broke them all in James chapter 2, verse number 10. It does reveal God's holiness and righteousness and our wickedness. But the law leaves us without hope. The Bible said the law is holy and it's good. Now I want to preach on grace for a few minutes and we'll go home. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and 9, the Bible said, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. That's very, very important. It is the gift of God. Salvation is an active gift. Salvation is by grace. Grace is a gift. I want you to listen to me carefully. Salvation is not wages for our good works. I am not doing good. I'm not preaching to be saved. I don't go to church to be saved. I don't try to do right to be saved. It is not wages for our good, for our works. Nor is salvation a reward for goodness. In fact, salvation is not a reward. Salvation is a gift. Neither is salvation an exchange of benefits. Oh, Lord, I'll, I'll do this. I'll serve you, Lord, if you'll save me. No. You'll die lost and go to hell. The only way God saves anybody 
is you kneel at the cross of Jesus Christ and accept the shed blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the way God saves anybody. God's not, God's not, what's His name, Monty, what's His name? He's not making a deal with you. Grace is a gift. Grace is several things. Number one, it is unmerited favor. Grace is the unmerited. We don't deserve the favor and love and mercy of God, and yet He gives it to us. Grace is not only unmerited favor, it's undeserved mercy. We don't deserve God's mercy, but He offers it to us. But now let me say something to you tonight. God never offers grace and mercy to a person except through the merits of Jesus Christ taking your sin upon His place. The only way God, a righteous, holy God, can forgive and release a condemned sinner is that someone else has, paid, has satisfied the just demands of the holy law of God. And Jesus Christ did that. And that's why God can give you grace. And that's why God can give you mercy. is because Jesus took your punishment. And you and I can go free. Grace, though, is more than that. And this is what I love about grace. Grace is that work of the Holy Spirit of God in us to produce a desire and the power to obey God. Now, that just rankles some people's soul, buddy. But I'm going to take because, you know, if it's different, something you've ever heard. But let me tell you, Paul said this. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. He said, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God in me. You know what he said? The grace of God was laboring in him. Can I tell you tonight that it's the grace of God that allows me and gives me the desire and the power to get up here and preach every Sunday and Sunday night and Wednesday night and go year after year after year? It's nothing but the grace of God. My flesh would want to quit. But God's grace is sufficient. It's the desire and power given to us by God to obey Him and to please Him. Grace is not an entitlement either. There's nothing we've ever done to deserve it. God's heart is the source of grace. The reservoir of grace is that it's sufficient. My grace is sufficient for thee. This week I was talking to a man. Let me, uh, in fact, I'll just, it was brother, uh, brother Larry Brown. And I want you to pray for Brother Larry. I'll tell you something. He's, you talk about going through the ocean. He's going through the ocean. He lost his wife. He's pastored there 38 years. That's all he's ever known. I mean, he does not have a second deal to fall back on him like that. And now he's not in that church anymore, and he's totally out in evangelism. You know, and just, you know he's, he's out here, and he said, Reggie, he said, I'm praying that God will just give me the grace to. He said, I really don't. I'm not seeking a wife at all. But he said, you know, he said, I, I may have some struggles with that. I don't know. But he said, pray that I'd be content in this singleness of life that God has given me now. But he said, Reggie, I want to tell you this. He said, God's been giving me grace. And I said to him, Brother Larry, my experience has been this. Is that God never wastes grace on people. God gives grace when people need it and not before. And you, do, you may think, man, I could never do that. I couldn't go through that. You don't know what you can do when you, but when you get the grace of God to do it with. And so the grace of God, His reservoir is His sufficiency. But the channel of grace is through faith. And God gives every man a measure of faith to believe and trust the Lord. But the instrument of God's grace is the cross of Calvary, and that's the instrument by which He gives us grace. But the recipients of grace are who? The recipients of grace are the humble. He giveth grace to the humble. You, listen to me. You will never get the grace of God until you admit you are a sinner, and you admit that you are lost, admit you sinned against God, and you agree with God and come humbly. And God, listen, you'll never get grace till you humble yourself. You cannot get grace as long as you're proud. You will never get grace as long as you're blaming everybody else for your life problems. You'll never get grace as long as you're rationalizing all the junk. You'll get grace when you come to God and say, Lord, I no longer argue with you or anybody else about it. Lord, I just need your sweet grace. Lord, forgive me my sin and give me the grace that I need. And that continues throughout your life. Let me show you how much better grace is than law. The first miracle, now Moses, remember, the law came by Moses, and grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. All right? The first miracle of Moses was when he turned water into blood. And that water turning to blood was a symbol of death. And a picture of a funeral. But the first miracle of Jesus Christ by which grace and truth came he turned water into wine, which is a picture of the Holy Ghost in life, and it was at a wedding. How many would rather have grace than law? Amen. The first miracle Moses done was turning water into blood. The law, you know what the law will do? It brings death. 
The first miracle Jesus done was turn water into wine. Life. A wedding. Joy. Now watch this. This Bible is pictured as water. Now you're clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. This Bible is pictured as the washing of regeneration by the word of God. The law will turn this water into death for you. Can't save you. But grace will turn this water into wine for you. I won't say that again. Pre- the law will turn this water into blood. And here's what it is. And it all depends. You know, what's, you know what depends on what is turned, whether you get grace or law. And if you, won't, if you try to stick with the law and you say, I'm not going to receive Jesus' grace, I'm going to go. So you have no option then but to go by law to the court of God in judgment. It's going to bring death. But if you humble yourself and get grace, God will take the same word of God and turn it into wine for you. That same water turned turn it into wine for you. And this will be the happiest thing you've ever got a hold of in your life because it saved you. Moses, in Exodus chapter 10, brought darkness upon the whole land of Egypt. But when Jesus came, grace, he brought light into the world. He said, I'm the light of the world. Moses, the last scene in Egypt was death. As the firstborn were killed. But one of the last things that Jesus ever did was the miracle of uh, that was the resurrection of Lazarus and his own resurrection. So what you see is both the first and the last of the law, the difference in it is life, uh, death and life, darkness and light, and, uh, and burials and resurrections. And that's the difference between law and grace. Watch this. In Exodus chapter 32, the first time that the law was preached, There were 3,000 people killed. In Acts chapter 2, the first time grace was preached, there were 3,000 people saved. Law came by Moses. Grace came by Jesus Christ. The law will strip you, but grace will clothe you. In Exodus chapter 32, the law comes. The people were naked. Proclaiming the law reveals our nakedness and our shamefulness. Did you know I me? Mean, when you preach the law, see, this is why people don't want to hear preaching the law, because you get up and preach the law of God, and all of a sudden their self-righteousness is stripped off, and their religion is stripped off, and, 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 and the Holy Ghost of God uncovers their secret sins, and all of a sudden they're naked before God and guilty, see. And that's what the law does. But if they'll stick with it and get grace, God will clothe them with His righteousness. The Bible teaches us in Mark chapter 5, what's this? That demonic man... He was naked. But when Jesus came, the Bible said he was sitting in clothed and in his right mind. The law on the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite went by. They were symbols of the law. And if you remember, that man had been hit. He was stripped. But here comes the Good Samaritan. Picture Jesus Christ takes him to the end, clothes him, takes good care of him. The Bible teaches that the saints will be clothed in fine linen, white and clean, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. I want you to pay attention because, boy, this, is, this stuff is so good. Remember this morning that the Bible said, that the Bible, and the law will say, watch this, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Now, I believe that passage of Scripture, but you know what? That's law. But you know what that is? That's law. You know what grace says? Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. The law says, you seek God. You try to find God. And that's what people are doing. They're trying to find God. But grace, God seeks you. And you know that's the truth. God sought me out. And God found me. And God found you by His sweet grace tonight. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. In Leviticus 18.5, the law says, what's this? Do and live. But grace says, live first and then do. You see, you can do and never live spiritually. Grace says, live and do. Grace works from the cross. Grace says it is finished. And what is finished is the just demands of a holy God against the sinfulness of man in the Lord Jesus Christ's death, birth, and resurrection. The law says that that you become a son by service. But grace says you become a son by love. At the burning bush, the law was put off your shoes for the ground you're standing on is holy ground. But grace says that he puts the, he, we're shod with the gospel of peace. God puts shoes on us. Grace 
You see, it's demonstrated in Luke chapter 15 that the prodigal son, the law would have said to that prodigal son, keep away. But grace ran down to meet him when he saw him coming. The law would have put his foot on his neck and said, kill him. But grace fell on his neck and kissed him. The law would have said, punish him. But grace said, forgive him. The law would have said, strip him. But grace said, clothe him. The law would have said, bind him hand and feet. But law said, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Grace would have said, kill him because he cursed his father. But, but, but law, the law would have said, kill him because he cursed his father. But grace would have said, come. He that was dead is now alive. The law would have said judgment, but grace says mercy. The law would have said be angry, but grace said rejoice. And that whole thing that the father did when that prodigal son returned is a picture of the opposite of what the law would have done in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The law demands holiness, watch this, but grace gives holiness. There used to be a sign that's still right there. Y'all see that sign over on the wall? Run, John, run. The law demands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. Don't ever forget that. The woman taking adultery. The law said what? Stole her. But grace said that was Moses. Did you know that's exactly what Moses said? But Jesus was standing there. Grace said, neither do I condemn thee, but go and sin no more. It was neither legalism nor licentiousness. That's what grace said. Law said, and listen close. You just read this in the text this morning in Deuteronomy 6. The law says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind. And by your own testimony this morning, you sat there and said, none of you said you'd ever loved him with all your heart. And you know what that means? That we're lawbreakers. And if we broke just that law right there, we're guilty of hell, and every one of us in here is guilty of it. But let me tell you what grace says. First John 4.10. Herein is love. Not that we love God. <laughs> Not that we love God, but that He loved us. And gave His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That means that His Son satisfied the just demands of a holy God on the cross of Calvary. Isn't that something? Law says, love God! You said, I'm trying to, but I don't. Can I tell you something? The truth about it is tonight, your spirit, the new man in you, does love the Lord, doesn't he? But your flesh doesn't love God. Don't you kid yourself. Your flesh doesn't love God. We couldn't love God, but God loved us. You know, it's not how much I love God, but it's how much God loves me that counts. God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what counts. It's not how much I love God, because I don't love God very much. But it's how much God loved me, and He loved me so much that He gave His only begotten Son to die on the cross for my sin. The law said, come every year and never be perfect. But grace says, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. The law says, I'm condemned already. John 3, 18 says, we're condemned already. But grace says, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And this is the biggest thing, one of the best news you're ever going to hear in your life. Under the law, under the law, the sheep died for the shepherd. But under grace, the shepherd died for the sheep. But I want to tell you something. Law came by Moses, but grace by our Lord Jesus Christ. Why does God give us grace? Why does God give us grace? It's the only way we can be saved. There's no other way for us to be saved except through grace. Ephesians 2 and 6 and 7 says that in the ages to come. Whoo, man, alive. In the ages to come. Can you imagine? Some of these days, Ralph, I ain't going to be tired no more. Seems like I've been tired ever since I got past my teenage years. <laughs> that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. In his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Old rotten sinners like you and I are nothing but the trophies of the grace of Almighty God. 
The world says this, and religion says this. Good men go to heaven and bad men go to hell. But grace says, good men go to hell and bad men go to heaven. Y'all, y'all understand why I call this the first church of the salvage yard? Y'all understand why I, 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 I come out, I'll, I'll come out from the pulpit. I mean, literally in a spiritual sense, I'll come out every once in a while and charge the devil head on because I never want legalism to creep into this church. I always want this church to remember that we were wicked, sorry, low down, hell deserving sinners saved by the grace of God. And I don't ever want that to be lost to the theme of this church because the day we lose that, we've lost the glorious presence of the Holy Spirit's sanction upon this work. No wonder Ruth bowed before Boaz and said, Why have I found grace in thine eyes? No wonder John Newton wrote, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I heard the illustration one time of a bird. And I've seen, how many have ever seen birds in churches? Birds fly in churches every once in a while. A little boy said he was sitting back in church and he was struggling with this. He's struggling about salvation, struggling about this thing of grace and works, law and works and so forth. He said, a bird flew in. He said, that bird realized that he had made a mistake. You know, he'd, he'd come to church. <laughs> but he said, that bird flew here, and he flew there, and he'd land here. And he said, that bird about beat himself to death, trying to figure out how to get out of there. But he said he wouldn't stop flying. He'd just fly here and fly and fly and fly. And he said, all of a sudden, the old bird just got tired, weary, and he dropped down and sat on the pew, and he said, he's looking straight at the door. He said, the bird went, Choo! And he said, it was like the Holy Spirit said to me, why don't you quit just flying around inside church, beating yourself to death, trying to be who you think you're going to have to be good enough to go to heaven and just stop and rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And he said, the second I did that, I saw the light and I saw the door. Amen. Let me tell you something. Quit work trying to work your way to heaven. You ain't going to make it. Quit trying to be good enough to go, why don't you fall at the cross of Calvary and say, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. I ask your mercy. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Grace is given to the lowly. And by the way, when you're saved, don't try to live the Christian life any other way except by grace. Don't try to live the Christian life in the energy and power of the flesh. You can only live it by the grace of God. If we went to heaven in a ship, they'd call it the fleet of grace. The grace fleet. If we went to heaven in a train, it'd be Grace Railways. And if we went to heaven on an airplane, it'd be called Grace Airlines. Because we're going by grace. Amen? And if you ever see God's grace and its work in your life and in your soul, you'll have a new wave of God's love that'll wash over your spirit. His grace. He'll give you grace to serve Him, grace to love Him. Not because you have to. It'll be because you want to. And you know something? I want to commend you people here in a couple of weeks. So we're going to get out there on a burning hot July 2nd evening. And it's going to be, you know, and some of you is going to do something stupid to each other. And you're going to say something. And you're, somebody's going to want to do something. And somebody's going to say, no, we don't want to do it that way. <laughs> don't bring the beans out now. I'm not ready for them. This hamburger wasn't cooked good enough. That well, lettuce is wilted. Don't use that. You're cutting the watermelon pieces too thin. You didn't park them right. We're going to get out there, see, and we're going to try to serve people in Jesus' name. And you know what? We're going to need grace to put up with each other. And we're going to serve God by grace. Amen. We're going to serve God by grace. We're not going to go out there and do it in a letter. We're going to serve God by grace. We're going to esteem each other greater than ourselves. Love one another. Serve, serve people by the grace of God. I don't know about you, but I get to where man alive, I get to think about, I, don't know, that gets to be, I mean, I'm so slapped where I, and then the worst part about it is, Jeremy Harper, were you here tonight? Jeremy, not here. There you are, way back here. Jeremy, you know what? You always aggravate me out here at this thing because you work like a dog after it's over. The nicest thing you ever did was throw Don's in in the tank. <laughs> but that was just one time, wasn't it, Don? 
No, I get, I get done. You know, I'm honest with you. My feet, my arches are sunk. My, my legs are gone. And these guys are going, all right, let's clean up around here, man. They're just cleaning up everywhere. And I'm trying to act like I'm involved. <laughs> and all I'm wanting to do is, Lord, let me go home. <laughs> you know what we're just going to need? We're going to need some grace. You know, we need grace to keep coming to church together, don't we? How many of you had everybody, anybody in this church ever kind of ticked you off? You need grace to forgive, don't you? You need the grace to love each other. How many of you husbands and wives ever been mad at each other? You know what's going to take you know what's going to take to keep your marriage together? Grace. Sweet grace. The grace of God. By the grace of God we are what we are. Law came by Moses. Moses, you can have it. But grace came by Jesus Christ and truth. And that's what I want to live my life by. But I'll tell you something. I'm so happy tonight I'm saved by the grace of God. You know what else? I'm saved forever. I've been made a new creature in Jesus Christ. Saved, given eternal life in Jesus Christ, the grace of God. I want to ask you tonight a question. Are you saved by the grace of God? Have you ever been saved? Have you ever been born again? Have you been born again? I mean, have you been born again? Have you been saved by the grace of God? Not how good you are. Not how good your intentions are. Not how sincere you are. And have you trusted in Jesus Christ dying for you on the cross, shedding his blood, dying in your place as your sacrifice? And he died and buried and rose again. Have you trusted that? As your, is that what you're trusting tonight? If you're not trusting that, you're not saved. You're not saved by grace. You're not saved at all if you're not saved by grace. And so we're going to be around here tonight. We're going to get up. So I want us to come. To come. We're going to sing the wonderful grace of Jesus. What page is that, somebody? The wonderful grace, huh? 155, 155. Now, you're turning to your song books there, and, and uh, there ain't nobody here tonight but us, is there, R.A.? We the only ones here? Okay, just want to make sure. Brother Terry, we the only ones here? All right, now, there ain't nobody here but us tonight. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, I'd like to encourage you to just step out of your seat. I'd like to invite you to come down right there to that old wooden bench or that old wooden bench, or, 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 or I don't care where you get. You know, I heard about a lady got saved the other day, and this, I, I got so tickled because this is the way it is. They said this lady was, there's, there's a service going on, and she said about halfway back, and, and, and the preacher said, I saw her weeping uh, while I was preaching. said something just come over and said, I saw her weeping. And uh, said, to give the invitation, said she, she started to come out and said she got to come out of the pew and said she stopped. And said so she dropped on her knees and began to weep and said, God, if you're going to save me, you're going to have to do it right here. I can't go another step farther. This is it. You know, isn't that good? I'm glad. God, aren't you glad God saved you before we can get to the altar? Amen. Amen. You know what I really think? I think most people get saved before they ever get there. And you know, tonight you can be saved before you, you can be saved right where. But I want to invite you. You ought to make it public. You ought not be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to speak to those that are saved tonight. You may be struggling. You may be going through a tough old time. You know what you really need tonight? You need grace. You need lots of it. The best thing you can do is just humble yourself and say, Dear God, I want to humble myself before you. I'm not going to be arguing about this, that, or the other with you and asking you why. Lord, just give me grace to go through what I'm going through. Grace for every trial in life. Let's stand together tonight. You do what God tells you want to do tonight. Here it is. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sins.